And now it's John Daniels, principal lecturer, Manchester Metropolitan University. Merci. Good morning. Um, first of all, stand. If you're on the end of an aisle, not next to anybody, just move so you're next to somebody. So if you move to the end, you need somebody with you. Everybody face this way. This way. I need your attention, and you've worked hard this week. You deserve this, okay? Hands on shoulders in front. Monsieur, monsieur, you move. You move, you move. Hands on shoulders in front. Are you ready? Be gentle. Need the muscle. Need the muscle. You will get your revenge. Don't hurt anybody. We need you this afternoon. Okay, stop. Turn this way. Hands on front. Need the muscle. Push, push. A little bit harder. A little bit harder. Très bien. Okay, thank you. Take a seat. Okay, okay, now I have your attention. Listen, my name is John Daniels. I'm from the Manchester Metropolitan University Department of Exercise and Sports Science. Um, the, pur pur the purpose of my presentation today is to try and show you how we explain how our programs in sport work and if they work. Sport has all these grand claims. It can change people's lives. It can be equal. It can be unequal. And we need specific research methods to try and tease out and explain what mechanisms are there to try and so we learn more about these programs and we improve them and we make them equal. Uh, so over the next 20 minutes, half an hour, I'm going to demonstrate to you, I'm going to tell you a little a brief history of, of disability sport and then tell you a little bit about a gymnastics program aimed at very young children, five, six years old, and how we recorded the experiences that those children had through the eyes of the coaches. Um, I'll, I'll explain in more detail later and some of the outcomes of the program um, related to those experiences. So first of all, um, how did we get here uh, in terms of disability sport? Some of the earliest programs we have in sport were for uh, deaf people and the, the Germans integrated them into sport way back in, in turn of the 19th century. Um, but people with a disability were viewed as second-rate citizens. They were weak. They were non-productive. Um, a concept no, known as social Darwinism, where people were about the survival of the fittest, and people with a disability um, were seen as unfit, which is ludicrous. We all, our experiences this week, have proved that hypothesis wrong. Um, and then we move on uh, to more recent times, and the Second World War changed everything. And a guy called Dr. Ludwig Guckman, the gentleman in the picture, who started to use sport and physical activity to rehabilitate injured soldiers from the war. He conceptualized disability sport in the UK. He gave rise, in his, he worked in the Stoke Mandeville Hospital. This progressed to the Stoke Mandeville, uh, uh, Mandeville Games. 
and then on into, into the 1960s where everything really changed in terms of integration, intervention through the uh, para, first Paralympic Games in the 1960s in Rome. And since then, equity has ebbed and flowed in terms of sport and sport policy. Where are we now? Um, a lot of the information I will give you today is um, based in England. Um, it'd be good later in the questions if you can compare in your own countries uh, and, and maybe we can explain why there might be differences or maybe similarities. But it's a good time in um, the UK for disability sport. We have a conservative government who are normally obsessed with winning um, uh, and, and protecting the state in their only conservative way that they can, but they've actually challenged sport um, as a conservative government to target those that are hard to reach. So they're interested in equity. Uh, they're interested in targeting women because they're underrepresented. They're interested in targeting older people because there are more and more of them uh, and less and less of them are doing sport. And they're interested in disability and disability sport, because uh, they're underrepresented group as well. So, um, as we can see there, if you are uh, a person with a disability, you are half as likely as a person who isn't, hasn't got a disability to do sport. So around in, in England, can anyone tell me in England? I'll challenge the English. I'll challenge the English. What percentage of our population, not the disabled population, but what percentage of our population do sport once per week? Anybody guess? What percentage? 47, can anyone else offer a guess? Ivan, is he gone? Anna, Anna Novik? 30? Good, yes, yeah, about 30%. So the percentage of uh, the people with a disability population is only around 15% of them doing sport once a week. That is not equal. That is not equal. There is something not right in our policy, in our strategy, in our efforts to try and get more people with a disability doing sport. And one of the reasons for that is we don't tell enough stories. Uh, we don't capture the experiences of good people. So we don't know what good practice is. We don't know what access there is and what works for certain people in certain situations. Health, education, they all have this evidence. In sport, we have very little evidence. So we just don't know why these, reasons, why these disparities are apparent. So the government, the UK government, are going to distribute funding to focus on those people who tend not to take part in sport, the groups that I've just mentioned. And they're interested in health. They're interested in not sport for sport's sake now and winning medals like they were for the London Olympic Games. The whole sports policy environment changed and all the money was diverted into athletes and clubs and national governing bodies. And if you were good at sport, the money would make you better so that you would inspire the next generation uh, to do more sport, you know, which, which is a weak case because you need to win at the Olympics to inspire people. Uh, and London was our one chance and we did good. And participation went up uh, for disability, sport went up too. But now it's in decline. And there is no money. We're all aware of that. So we're having to capture money and partnerships internationally, like this, and from different areas and different agendas, such as education and health. And what better way to champion disability sport by showing its health benefits? There is no better area in sport where you can demonstrate health outcomes than in disability sport. So it's a good time um, for, for disability sport in the UK. The trouble with our research is it's focused on the medical and health benefits. So we talk, we read journals and we read articles, uh, and it was useful to see some social analysis in the previous presentation, but it's, it's usually about reductions in seizures. It's usually about body dysmorphia, muscle hypertrophy. It's, it's, it's normally about blood pressure, cholesterol, all these things. Uh, there's some psychological profiling. And this is good. This is important. But it doesn't really tell us how to inform practice. It doesn't really tell us how to improve our interventions and the experiences that 
people on the interventions are having. We're not listening to their voices. So we need a new approach, a more sociological analysis. Uh, and my presentation will show you an evaluation of a disability project. This is just some uh, background. So the government as well is saying, go forth and experiment and try new interventions, but be mindful of what works at project level. So here, which projects are working? Can we share this practice? Does it only work in this situation for certain disabilities? And if so, then why aren't we using that information to inform other disability sports projects? So the government, have, for the first time in a long time, are targeting, the first time in nearly 20 years, are targeting the hard to reach, those that aren't really interested in sport or cannot get interested in sport for whatever reasons, access for example. And they're interested in hearing their stories this time. And they're interested in projects that are um, using, you know, different methods to try and capture this evidence. So the, uh, Sport England, our agency, our national body, uh, funding body for sport in England, used to be only interested, and still is to a certain extent, in key performance indicators. How many men are in the, dis are, are in the sports projects? How many women? How many old people? It's tick, tick, tick. Count all the bodies. Um, but they're not interested in the quality of that service. And now the government is saying, okay. The trouble is, nobody knows how to do it in sport. I didn't know how to do it when I was a sport development officer 15, 20 years ago. We just ticked the box, we got the funding, we moved on. But now we're being challenged uh, to talk to the people on our programs to make sense of what they're doing. So the research context, this is, this is my specialism, gathering evidence. Um, refining theory, developing new theories based on the experiences of people involved in the different projects. So this is a single case study called a disability sport project in South Cheshire in England. It involved around 30 children, all under the age of 10 years old, some children as young as three, with very profound physical and sensory disability, which had some challenges for the research. You know, most of the children that I was uh, observing in the programs couldn't speak, couldn't communicate. So I couldn't interview them. Most of the parents were frightened to death of me being there um, in case, you know, I intruded in some way in their, in their program. So I had to build relationships with the whole family in order to be involved in the research. And this has held research back. It's difficult for us to go into these people's lives and capture the realities of their experience. And the realities of the experience are different for everybody, for each person. You and I all play sport, but we all have slightly different realities and perspectives in sport based on our background, our wealth, our education, and it's no different for the, for the young person. So I did, uh, an this, this is a single case taken from a larger thesis that, that looked at 11 projects and I've just extracted the disability sports project today. There was a series of semi-structured interviews with the academy coaches who were fantastic. Um, and it's through their eyes that I've captured the experiences. I tried to interview the parents, they're really important, but they, were, they didn't want to. Another difficulty. Um, I tried to observe the sessions, but there's, again, this had different. So I, so I interviewed the coaches over a period of a few years, three years, which was really useful. And, and this is the other problem in sport, in England anyway. I don't know if it's the same in other countries. Policy time periods are short, two, three years. And you're asking to change a life. That takes 10, 15 years. So the time that we have these, this is the longitudinal Time. This is about as long as it gets, three years, so we can start to measure proper lifestyle changes and behavior changes. I used a realist evaluation technique. So this is based on work by Bascar, uh, critical realism. Um, so capturing the realities of uh, as near to, you can never capture reality, um, but as near to reality as you can to try and explain using the power of explanation or logical reasoning. So. These, are, these coaches were the experts. They, we call it division of expertise. This is how I chose the coaches that I was going to interview. 
Who knows what works? They had 30 years of experience at these programs. So they knew. Although they admitted in the interviews, they were learning every day um, through, through disability sport. So the model on the right there um, explains my framework for looking at the interviews, interpreting what was said, with a view to evaluating the disability sport program. Did it work? Did it meet its outcomes? Did it improve health? I'll describe the program in one second. Here, let's work backwards. We're sports people. We read the newspapers from the back pages to the front. So I'll use that philosophy in, in the model. The outcome for the program, so the Paulson and Tilly's model says that Outcomes will happen and will be triggered, or regularities, you can use interchangeable the outcome or, or regularity, will happen. So an outcome might be an improvement in some health indices or behavior. These outcomes will happen and they are triggered by mechanisms. The mechanism is the session. It is the gymnastics session. It is the football session. It is the exercise session. It is the rehabilitation. That is the mechanism. Okay? They will trigger the outcomes. But the really important part of this model, and, and you mentioned context, is the ellipsis. This, the oval. That mechanism, the activity, will only trigger outcomes in specific circumstances. I'll give you an example. Have you heard of cardiac rehabilitation? So if you have a heart attack, you don't want another one, basically. Nobody wants two or three, for that matter. So if you have a heart attack in the UK, and this will be similar in other countries, I'm sure, um, you, your consultant surgeon fixes things, may put things inside your heart, pacemaker, bypass, um, keeps you alive. Uh, but you need to change your lifestyle because that's what caused the heart attack in the first place. So once you've been discharged from hospital in cardiac rehab, you come to a, a lifestyle course where we do behavior change intervention. And so the outcome might be a reduced risk of another heart attack. And the cardiac rehabilitation exercise scheme caused that outcome. But it only caused that outcome in the context that the specialist lifestyle instructor, the fitness instructor, the gym instructor, gave confidence to the, part, the patient that they, they were in safe, the patient was in safe hands. They were in expert hands. That will, that's, the, that's the context, that the gym equipment and the standards and qualifications of the experience of the staff were in place, they were good. So that's context, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in the, about the program. So we need to know, we need to know, okay, we need to know what the program is. So this is the, pro, this is the program that I evaluated. This is what it looks like. This is called a logic model. And it describes from left to right the workings of the intervention. We use these all the time to, to summarize what the program logic is. So the inputs are the partners. These are the disability sports coaches. These are the people who are responsible for delivering the project, coming together and working together. The volunteer sports coaches, one of the brilliant things that we have in, in Manchester behind the university, it's moved now, but it was behind the university, was all our coaching students could access this facility. And everything they thought they knew in coaching sport was turned on its head when they went into the disability sport environment. They had to think quicker. They had to reflect better. They had to work with other people quicker. They had to think on their feet and reason uh, their, and, and better structure their coaching plans. So, and the families, the families were really important. They were integral to this program. So those are the inputs. Next are the actual activities, the mechanisms. So we've got one session per week of disability girls football. The reason we're doing this, by the way, that we identified the problem with our local survey that said that these populations, women, disabilities, women especially, were underrepresented in sport in South Cheshire. So we have two things. We have we had the football session and we have the disability gymnastics session, both targeted at children. Okay? And then you have the outcomes of the um, program. The initial outcomes, get more people doing more sport. Um, also, offering a range of activities. Well, we are offering a range of activities in the outputs. 
intermediate outcomes, staying in their sport, because dropout is ridiculously high, especially in disability sport, which is why they need to have a very good experience in order that they stay in the sport and to make it accessible, cheaper. So this was free to them. The, pro the program didn't cost the participants anything. Uh, and then the long-term outcomes, obviously, creating safer... So these these long-term outcomes were agreed through the Sport England and the local authorities. This is what, in their local strategy, health strategy and sports strategy, these, these are the long-term outcomes, which may take two or three years to arrive at. Okay? So this is the program that we evaluated. What did we find out? After interviewing the coaches, the illustration is a thematic map from the interviews. So the ovals or the ellipses, they are the main themes that came out of the interview. The first theme, there was lots of discussion about participant development, and the coaches couldn't keep up with it. So in my experience with this program, what happened was um, we had a new age group that really challenged the coaches. They were much younger. This, this specialist center normally dealt with 16 years and above teenagers. Um, so they were stronger maybe, more developed, a better sense of the world uh, and interaction with it. With the younger children, this wasn't apparent, but, but it's really important we get the younger children into gymnastics early or football early. These early experiences are sustained throughout life, their lifetime. So the earlier we get them, the better. And the earlier we get them, the better for their health as well, as they develop. 16 is too late. So this, these coaches challenge themselves by getting younger children into the, into the group. So the participant development progression, the, the rectangles, the boxes, are the sub-themes. So the way we explain participation, participant development uh, was they were entering competition. So they went from not doing sport at all and within six weeks, we're doing competitive sport at five and six years old. So football, the trouble is there's no infrastructure to support them. You, 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 you develop a, a football scheme in South Cheshire for disability sports for six-year-olds, but you're the only one. So you can't compete against different teams. So there's no equity, there's no access. And so these schemes have to, you have to work harder at reaching out to other community schemes so that, there is, that you can have competition. Um, the other discussion was about the role of an influence of family, and that was crucial in the success of the scheme, especially with younger children. What we found was that the parents of the children um, were too afraid to let them do sport. The, even one of the parents said, you know, it's too fragile, you can't do it, they break bones. They damage themselves. This is not true. They're, and this is because the coaches had to build a relationship and say, we're not going to hurt them. We know what we're doing. Uh, we, will, we, will stick, we will stick to what we know uh, and we, we deal with these people. The parents wrap these children in cotton wool. And that's one of the problems we have. This fifth, if you're, you're half as likely to do sport if you're a person with a disability. One of the main reasons for the younger children uh, and this statistic is that the parents are just too afraid to let them go. So, we had to involve the parents to reinforce the message that sport was safe and vibrant for them. And so in the initial five or six sessions, five or six weeks, the parents were doing the gymnastics sessions with them, the football sessions with them. And that wasn't, that the only reason for doing that was to convince the parents that this was a good thing to do. And it helped them bond, you know. So there was lots of discussion about the role and the influence of family. The parents socialized. They were talking about being together, and I'll explain, look through some of the quotes later on. They could see the achievements. They could see them getting better. Even if their child could sit up unaided, massive achievement. If their child had never played sport before, then scored a goal in a competition, huge achievement. Reinforcing behaviors that this sport environment is for everybody, not just for people without a disability. So the, the whole framework then allows us to try and connect what was said through the eyes of the coaches to the outcomes. So in, so this participant development and progression was contributing to health and well-being. And this role and influence of family was bringing people together. So it contributed to the long-term outcomes of creating stronger, safer communities, the power of sport. Um, just an anecdote, a few anecdotes now from, from the interviews. Um, Wendy, not her real name, um, but she was, 
interviewed and she said, some children have progressed so much that we've had to create a separate session. They've had to differentiate. The progress was very, very quick. And it would be. They're starting off from a very low baseline. Okay, they're four. They've never done sport before. Um, they do have frailties, but those frailties went away when they started to do physical frailties, confidence frailties, went away when they started to do this program. Um, we've had to change sessions quite drastically to suit the needs of the children, because in the smallest group, that's the really young children, the under fours, they've come, they come on so well, we felt that we now needed to be split into two classes, and we've differentiated on ability. Not disability, ability, and that's key. So, and this was good for the coaches. I remember them leaving the sessions and they would all meet in the corridor and say, we're going to have to change this afternoon's session. The, 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 the kids are so good at what they're doing. Everything we've written down for the plan this afternoon is void. It's not good enough. Some of the mechanisms. Why did this work? How can we explain why this worked? See, see Sport England always want numbers. We've got 50 people on our... Um, um, disability sports scheme. Great. How did you get 50 people on that? I don't know. Can't explain that. So we're using these methods to try and explain. So the mechanisms, according to the, uh, C the other senior coach, Simon, it's quite surprised us with the tiny ones, so the, you know, three, four years old, um, that the children, you know, age about, I should say three or four, really surprised us. But I think it was that they all had one-to-one -one support at the beginning. Now, this is, this is nothing new. We know we need a higher ratio of support for young people uh, with a disability uh, from coaches. So it's supporting that theory. It's refining it. So we explained it as high levels of support. And this is where the volunteer coaches came in and helped as well. So we know in the theory, in the literature, we know uh, levels of support are important if programs are to, be, uh, are to improve outcomes for this group of participants. So when we do it next time and we apply for funding, we need more volunteers, we need more coaches, because with more support, outcomes are easier to achieve. I think it's been very successful for the families, especially the tiny children, under four, and the most profoundly disabled children, because the families have seen their children achieve things, and it surprised us all. It's made the children bonding with those parents nice to see. Okay? So they're actually doing something now, together, through sport, not caring for them, but seeing them progress, being involved with them, communicating with them differently, having confidence to let go and let the child do sport. Again, reinforcing this learning and development, and we connect to the long-term outcomes of developing new skills. Small classes. Again, nothing new in disability sport, but we need small classes. So we have to be realistic and not try and make huge differences to participation numbers, but small and steady steps. So groups of three and four worked. Otherwise, we can't, that's the important context, we can't trigger the outcomes. And one of the impacts, something we didn't expect, which is really important for evaluation research, it'd be all too easy to just connect the dots to the outcomes of the program. But evaluation research is better than that, and it tries to... Um, capture what you've not foreseen. And one of the things, one of the impacts, what happened with, with the parents uh, in, captured in the second uh, quotation is that all the parents now meet in the corridor. They all meet with each other. And what's funny, and this is quite moronic because we're trying to improve health and they're all going to McDonald's. I don't think that's an oxymoron. I don't think that, that, that can work. And what's funny is now they all go over to McDonald's next door and have a coffee and chat and come back. So the parents, it's not just that they're together, it's the fact they've had the confidence to leave the children in the coach's safe hands to do sport, and they would never have done that before. Not with the small children anyway, the teenagers is different. So there's some respite too, and that's good. That's creating safer, stronger communities. So it's a social thing. So we summarize. This is how we, this is how we um, deliver the message back to the program leaders. We organize the data like this and summarize. Uh, over a three-year period, I must have done 30 interviews with these people. Um, 
And so it's quite difficult to summarize, but it is an objective data reduction method. So um, we improve, so the whole, this, is, this is relating back to the model with the ellipses and the regularity and the mechanism. So we'll start with the outcome. So we obs observation of improved physical motor abilities of participants. Um, this happened because we differenti differentiated participants based on ability, not disability. One-to-one -one coach support with younger age groups and mini competitions introduced are based on ability. And the context, we had to cope with the impact of the program and the participants, the fact that they developed so quickly, the fact that they enjoyed it so much. And, and this, this catalyzed the, the outcomes. Uh, ability to develop to, related to age. Uh, so, you know, there was this myth as a four or five-year-old child, the developments wouldn't be there because there's no communication. Um, there's lack of experience in sport. Um, it's a myth. They did. They did listen. They did enjoy. There was feedback. Uh, and the coaches inexperienced with younger age group. One of the important things is they didn't have any preconceived ideas about this group. They didn't go in there thinking, right, well, the model that I have for my 16-year-olds is going to work with my four-year-olds. They went in with a blank sheet. And that was brave, but they had to do that because dealing with four-year-old uh, children with a profound disability is very different than dealing with the older children, which might sound obvious, but here we are capturing it to try and refine the theory that's out there. Uh, and lower down in the bottom, just a couple of examples. Parents uh, enthused by the child's sense of achievement was one of the outcomes, so that we've got that skill development. The parents socializing, longer-term engagement, the children with the program, so there was sustained participation. And this is important. I go back to my first slide, and I'll ask my English students, put them on the spot, how many people with a disability have we lost from sport in the last 12 months? Any guess? Not seven? That'd be brilliant. <laughs> That would, well, no loss is good, but seven, no, no. 22,000 people with a disability have dropped out from sport in the last 12 months in the UK. This is a worry. This is why it's important we do research like this to try and demonstrate what works best in particular circumstances. Okay. And that's my main point, okay? So we need new ways to try and Evaluate different projects in the community, new science methods, new social research. We need to convince the, the government that this is valid evidence, that this is reliable, that this is useful, and that's the purpose of evaluation. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for his presentation. You show very well the importance of family, volunteers, coaches in these programs.